Welcome to tonight's event. I am Michelle Judd, the Executive Director of the WM Keck Institute for Space Studies, or KISS. Uh, KISS is a joint think tank between the Caltech campus and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we're focused on revolutionizing the way we do space exploration. Now, we are privately funded, so I just want to give a huge shout out to all of our individual private donors. Every dollar counts. Thank you so much. And especially to our Caltech Space Innovation Council, who is working so hard to raise the funds so that we can continue doing our important work. Now, this lecture series was designed for the KISS affiliates although we do make it open to the public and we have asked our speakers to make sure that uh, they speak at a level that will go all the way from the public to uh, our faculty here at Caltech. So if you don't quite get everything, that's totally okay. I can guarantee you, you will have an amazing lecture today. Now our KISS affiliates are nominated by Caltech faculty and they are graduate students and postdocs who have been identified as the next generation of space exploration leaders. These affiliates get to meet astronauts and industry CEOs and lab directors. Oh wait, that's November, come back then, you can meet one then. Uh, chief engineers or like today, truly outstanding space science researchers. So introducing our speaker today, will be Kai Matsuka, who is one of our 2018 KISS affiliates. Uh, Kai is an, a National Science Foundation graduate student uh, research fellow at Caltech, and he studies formation flying spacecraft. Now, in an interview last year, he was asked this really weird question, and it was, what celestial body would he be and why? Well, he responded, I would love to be Oumuamua, the interstellar object that zipped by the solar system. It's all kind of eccentric. It's got a quirky shape. It tumbles like a top and it travels in interstellar space at the whipping speed of 26 kilometers per second. So part of Oumuamua means scout in Hawaiian. So I would like to scout other systems like Oumuamua did in our solar system. So Kai, you are the perfect person to formally introduce our speaker. So take it away. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, introduction, Michelle. Um, I am very excited to have our uh, special guest, Dr. Karen Meach here as our speaker tonight. Dr. Meach is an astronomer at the University of Hawaii. Her research investigates how habitable worlds form and explores the bigger picture of whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. Dr. Mitch believes in the power of interdisciplinary approach to scientific research, and as such, her research combines geological fieldwork, astronomical observations, theory, and space missions to address the fundamental question about how Earth got its water. In her career, she has served as co-investigators on multiple common missions, uh, such as Deep Impact, Epoxy, and Stardust Next. Recently, she has also led the teams observing and characterizing interstellar objects, uh, such as Oumuamua. And Dr. Meech was one of the co-leads in a 2018 uh, KISS workshop for large constellations and formations for exploring interstellar objects and long period comets, uh, where I had the pleasure of working with her. Uh, she obtained her bachelor's degree in space physics from Rice University and her PhD in planetary physics from MIT. And she's won so many awards for research, teaching, her contributions to NASA missions uh, that listening them now will be uh, longer than my entire introduction. Uh, so with that, it is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Karen Beach to begin her lecture. Thank you very much, Kai, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to everyone. So I would like to give you a story of an object that has disrupted my scientific life in an exciting way for about four years. So in fact, let me start the story with um, 2017. 
I had just gotten back from a science conference and I'd been working like a dog for months. And so it was a Sunday and I was looking forward to finally having a day off. And that's when I got a phone call from a colleague. Uh, Richard Wainscoat leads the survey that uses the PanSTARRS telescope. This is PanSTARRS shown um, in this beautiful image. This was designed and built by the University of Hawaii. And its primary mission right now is to survey the sky, roughly the entire sky visible from Hawaii every three weeks to hunt for potentially hazardous objects. And so what had been found was on October 19th, he and his colleague, Richard Wainscoat, who looks at the data coming in every morning, had found an object towards the edge of the big array. This is the whole PanSTARRS array. You can see it covers a wide region of the sky. Here's full moon to scale. And one of the images was a faint moving object. They found it in the previous night's data on Wednesday the 18th and got a couple more nights of data. But by Sunday, when Richard called me, they were certain that the orbit meant it was coming from outside the solar system. <clears throat> so here's what the orbit looked like. Here's the plane of the solar system. It was coming down from above the plane of the solar system. It had already made its closest approach to the sun, actually passing inside the orbit of Mercury. So coming within about 55 radii of the sun, and it was on its outbound leg when it was spotted by pan stars. So here's a blow up of that inner portion. Here's where the earth was and the object was discovered on its outbound leg. Now, when it was first discovered, it was given a boring catalog name, which as we started to communicate with each other, uh, was very difficult to type. And so, of course, we gave it a nickname very briefly. We started to call it Rama for a while. Then it got a couple of official names. And then finally, as noted, it was given an official name in the Hawaiian language, meaning scout or messenger sent from the distant past to reach out to us or build connections with us. So now many people may ask, why did you discover it on the outbound leg? It certainly would have been nicer to discover it on the inbound leg. Well, of course, if we were to discover it much earlier, the telescopes on Earth would have had to have pointed towards the sun, and you don't discover objects in the daytime. Of course, when it was on its inbound leg, maybe we could have seen it earlier, but at that point, it would have just been too faint. It was discovered pretty much as soon as it could have been. There were some archival data that were found that had some images of Oumuamua on its closest Earth approach five days earlier on the 14th, and it was actually at its brightest on the 17th. A lot of people ask where it is today, and in fact, it is just about a little over halfway from the distance between the planet Uranus and Neptune. So it's about 25 astronomical units or Earth-Sun distances. So although it was racing past the Earth really fast, it's still actually within the solar system. So why was this such an exciting and important discovery that meant we had to drop everything? Well, in the process of building a solar system, you start out with a cloud of gas and dust that slowly collapses and the materials start to clump together, building ever and bigger, ever and ever bigger pieces from centimeter scale to meters to kilometers. And once they get to kilometer scale, we begin to call them planetesimals. And eventually these will assemble into the rocky planets, or if there's enough mass and they start to gravitationally attract gas, the gas giants. A lot of this material doesn't actually get incorporated into planets as they get close to the gas giants. They can be thrown out of the solar system either completely or out to the outermost regions where they're stored in a deep freeze. And sometimes we see the ones that had ices come back inwards today as comets. So because it was so important and we felt we actually had a piece of a process of planet building from another solar system, we wanted to do everything possible to study this. But this was going to be a real challenge and here's why. This is a, a graph that shows its brightness as a function of time. On this side, it's the visual brightness and this is a logarithmic scale that astronomers use, but uh, a magnitude difference of five is a factor of 100 in brightness. So at the discovery, it was just about at its brightest. By the time we realized what it was a few days later, 
it was fading rapidly. And of course, we had to get telescope time to do all the science we wanted to do. And in fact, it was fading so fast, we knew that we would need some of the biggest telescopes available to us on Earth. Now, normally you get telescope time by writing a proposal, it gets evaluated by your peers for scientific integrity, and maybe a few months later you hear about your time. We didn't have that kind of time because we had about a window of a week or two when this would be feasible to study. So what do we actually want to know about this? Um, we wanted to know what it is, first of all, how big is it, what's its shape, you know, the basic things to characterize a brand new first of its kind object. And of course, what is it made of? Where did it come from? Everybody was so excited that telescope directors gave us time immediately, and a lot of friends and colleagues said, sure, you can have some of my telescope time. So one of the easiest things to look at first is figure out how big it is, because how big something is depends on the amount of light that's reflected, um, that we detect at Earth, as well as its reflectivity. So these images are a series of images showing just one picture after another taken by Richard Wainscote with one of the telescopes on Mauna Kea, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Oumuamua is inside this yellow circle. And you can see as each picture moves along, it's getting a little bit brighter. These streaks are actually the stars. We were tracking the telescope on Oumuamua. Occasionally, these bright lines that go through are meteors that happen to pass through the field of view. So you can see it got a lot brighter. Now it's starting to get fainter again as it's passing among the stars. If you plot the brightness as a function of time, you see that it's going up and down. And in fact, it looked like Oumuamua was spinning with a period roughly about 7.3 hours. And so this is what it would look like with Oumuamua spinning. And so what we're seeing is the reflected light from the big side and then the little side as it gets fainter. So you can take a light curve and interpret its axis ratio from this. Now the brightness of Oumuamua changed by over a factor of 10, which is remarkable. We don't have things in the solar system that change by that much. And this led us to a suggestion that this thing is really elongated maybe as elongated as 10 to one. But when more and more astronomers started to put all their data together and we tried to fold it all together and look at what we call the light curve, it looked like a mess. What was going on? Well, it turned out that Oumuamua was not simply rotating in a simple manner. It was also nodding up and down and oscillating around its long axis, meaning it was wobbling like a top. And so that, creates a different way of interpreting the shape from this light curve data. And so in fact, Oumuamua could have actually been more of a flattened pancake-like structure. And this, this is a beautiful painting done by a space artist, Bill Hartman, of his interpretation of what Oumuamua might look like in terms of the general shape. So we now have our first detail about Oumuamua, the shape. What about some of its other characteristics, such as its size? Well, here's a couple of images of Oumuamua. This one is from Hubble Space Telescope, just a point of light. Here's an image, a series of images added together, taken through different colored filters to show us the color from the Gemini Telescope. And what we could infer from this, assuming it's about as reflective as most comets, was that it's really small, radius of only about 100 meters, in other words, about twice the length of a football field. On the other hand, um, what you should notice here is we don't see any characteristic comet tail. So this looks much more like an asteroid. No gas or dust was seen in any of the images. Then we looked at the color to try and understand what Oumuamua might be made of. At the point at which we did this experiment, it was starting to get quite faint. And so instead of using a, a spectrograph, which really breaks up the light into fine details, we measured it through color filters. And this shows in the whole region of visible wavelength where we can see with our eyes where this end is blue and this is red, that these black data points represent the relative amount of light reflected from red to blue. And so you can see it reflects more red light than blue. And the underlying curves here, this shows what comets look like. They're all red, whereas asteroids in the solar system have different types of reflectivity. 
So this is red like a comet. Here's an actual image of a comet. This is from the Rosetta mission, a black and white image and an enhanced color image that shows what red means. It really means it's an organic rich surface on comets and it reflects more red light. It's not gonna look like a, a bright red stop sign. But many other things in the solar system actually reflect more red than blue. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're covered in organics. It could just be iron rich minerals but we at least know that it looks similar to comets. Well, another one of the big questions that we really wanted answered was where did it come from? Because if we're trying to see if the planet building process is the same everywhere in the universe, we'd like to tie it to a particular star. So that was an interesting experiment. And the way in which you do that, here's again Oumuamua's, Oumuamua's path through the solar system. And of course, we only watched it on the outbound leg you make very precise position measurements all along the path and get it so precise that based on its gravitational motion around the sun, we can trace backwards to its home system. So we had a lot of data from both the ground-based telescopes and from space. And when we did this experiment, the team found that it did not fit with a trajectory just controlled by the sun's gravity. Because if you subtracted the path and it was controlled by the sun's gravity only, it should be, these are the residuals, these should all be clustered around zero. And you can see there's a lot of structure here. This, these two coordinates are like latitude and longitude on a sphere. So clearly something else was going on. And so the team led by Marco Michelli and David Farnacoccia at JPL tried to put an acceleration into the mix. And in fact, that fit beautifully. And you can see the residuals are now down to zero. So in fact, Oumuamua was accelerating out of the solar system. Now, this wasn't too surprising because we see this all the time with comets. Comets outgas and they don't often outgas completely uniformly. Here's comet um, from the epoxy mission. And you can see a lot of jets of activity where the ices get heated up uh, due to the influence of sunlight. They push dust from the surface and they don't come off of the solid body called the nucleus evenly. And this acts like little rocket thrusters. So we see this all the time. It can cause a comet to speed up or slow down. So that makes sense. Um, the only problem with that is with Oumuamua, where saw the gas and dust? So there's other possibilities for an acceleration. One could be the sun's radiation can actually exert a pressure, much like a solar sail, but that didn't seem plausible because that would imply an abnormally low density. Several other processes can cause an acceleration, but none of them fit with the observations. So, what about it? Was there any gas or dust? The Spitzer Space Telescope actually did a very sensitive search for gas. It, it stared at Oumuamua for 30 hours. This is the actual final composite image, and this shows the expected position of Oumuamua with a little bit of uncertainty, and there's no bright sources anywhere in here. So Spitzer did not see it, and they were looking for the gas, so they could only get some upper limits on the gas. In terms of dust, we did a whole number of experiments, stacking together all of our images, looking for the faintest amount of dust possible. Here's some stacked images, again, showing no dust, whereas this is a simulation where uh, one of my colleagues, Olivier Haino, ground up uh, in the model 200 kilograms of dust and spread it out in a tail uh, over a few thousand kilometers, and that's what it would look like two kilograms, you can still see it in the image. And then he applied various filtering techniques to enhance the dust and then did the same thing with the real images. And there's just nothing there. So if we assume maybe there was gas coming off to give it this push, where's the dust? Because gas should push dust off of the comet. Well, it turns out that many people had predicted for about 20 or 30 years that if one of these things ever passed through a star forming region or a cloud of gas and dust in space, it could erode the small dust, leaving only bigger boulders on the surface. And then we could get gas coming off with no dust. A little bit unusual, but it, it hangs together. So maybe Oumuamua 
really looks something like this. Uh, this is a little bit exaggerated, but maybe it did have uh, at least gas coming off of the surface. So let's take a look now again, since we're trying to address the question of where is Oumuamua's home star? We've got the trajectory now, it's accelerating. So let's take a look at what probably happened to Oumuamua as it left its home solar system. So we're looking at what might be a Oort cloud or the remnants of a young solar system. And there's Oumuamua circling in the middle. You can see it comes close to a giant planet. It gets ejected out of its home solar system on its way towards us in our solar system. That seems like pretty straightforward. As long as we know its path, we can go find that star. Not quite so easy. And Remarkably, there's been a space mission that just released a big uh, data set that enables us to do this experiment. And this was the Gaia mission from the European Space Agency. And what they did was make very, very precise measurements of not only the positions, but the motions of stars in our galaxy. So everything is moving. So we don't just need to know the path of Oumuamua, but as it goes farther back in time, we need to know where everything was. And the farther back you go, the less precise we have this information. So that's what makes this experiment so incredibly challenging. So what would make a good candidate when you're trying to trace it back? What are the characteristics of the star? Well, it needs to be something that we encounter recently because the farther back in time, the worse the errors. Of course, we need to pass close by the star, probably within one of that star's Oort cloud. This is the place where the ejected debris sometimes gets trapped. And on the scale, that's about 200,000 um, astronomical units or Earth-Sun distances, uh, one to 200,000. It also needs a low velocity because the ability for a giant planet to throw something out of the solar system is limited. So it can't do it really fast. And of course we need a star that's stable and on its main lifetime. So here's a graph that showed all the possible candidates that the team found. This is in order of time back into the past in millions of years. This is the encounter distance and the color coding, the darker the colors, the better, the slower moving they are. Ideally, you want something in this lower right-hand corner that's dark red. Nothing was found, but there were four candidates that were possible, but none of them played out. They were just all moving too fast. We didn't think they could get kicked out of their solar system. So unfortunately, we could not find Oumuamua's way home. And it's probable that this sort of experiment will never uh, be possible because of the errors and the inherent star motions. So what do we learn about Oumuamua? Well, it's like a comet or an asteroid. It's small, it spins, it's strangely elongated, and it's red. We didn't find any gas or dust, and it's probably not an alien spacecraft, and I'll get back to that one. What questions remain? Well, where did it come from? What's it made of? What can it tell us about solar system formation? Those were the big questions that we asked right at the beginning. So we didn't answer the things that we wanted to, but we found out a lot of intriguing information. For example, a new, couple of new things. This shape is really strange. Comets are not this elongated. And in fact, you would expect as young solar system bodies collide with each other, they get less elongated. And we found this one relatively recently, are there a lot of these out there? Interestingly, some of the papers, a lot of the papers that have been written have been trying to explain the strange shape. There's been people that have been modeling um, the shape in terms of maybe it was something exotic, like as it flew through space, it got eroded as it passed through clouds of gas and dust, like sandblasting. Other cases, maybe Oumuamua, was ejected from its host star in the dying stages of a star where it effectively melted Oumuamua and it became a fluid temporarily and then froze in a strange shape. Maybe like the um, beautiful comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 when it passed too close to our planet Jupiter and it got stretched apart by tidal forces, maybe that's what happened to Oumuamua. Or 
more recently, there's been some exotic ideas. Maybe its composition was completely unusual, made of molecular hydrogen, which will start to vaporize from the surface of the comet very far from the sun. And as it comes into the inner solar system, it just eroded unevenly, giving us this very elongated shape, kind of like the bar of soap analogy when you use it in the bathtub or the shower and it gets a flatter and longer shape than the original bar. Well, fortunately, we had a second object that was discovered just about two years later, and this gives us the opportunity to study another interstellar object. And of course, interestingly, this one occurred just about at the same time of year as we were getting ready for that same big science meeting, which meant that yet again, people weren't paying attention to the science meeting. They were scrambling to get data on the second interstellar object but we were luckier on this one. This was discovered by an amateur astronomer, and this one was discovered on its way into the solar system. This shows its orbit here. It's coming in above the plane and going down below. This one did not come as close to the sun. The other one inside the orbit of Mercury, this one was just outside the orbit of Mars. And what that means is it was going much slower. So it took us quite a bit longer to decide that this one was also interstellar. But even the very first discovery images show a faint hint of a tail. So what have we learned about the second one, which is called Comet Borisov? Well, the HST images show it does look very cometary, a beautiful tail, a nice galaxy in this image. And you can actually uh, zoom in near the core and try and estimate its size. And just like Oumuamua, this one also is very small, perhaps as small as Oumuamua. Um, we also saw that it's probably getting a little bit smaller. It, it broke into two pieces in March. And then again, there was another fragment that broke off of it in um, July of 2020. It obviously had dust and almost immediately astronomers saw gas. Uh, this is what we call a spectrum. This is again in the visible wavelength region from about the blue to the green, uh, as you would see by the naked eye. And what this is showing on separate dates is the emission of light from the gas. You see one strong line here. Uh, this is actually identified as cyanide. That doesn't mean it's driven by cyanide or that that's the only species there. But when we're looking at comets as they get closer to the sun, this is usually the first thing we see because it interacts so strongly with sunlight. So it was looking very much like a comet. We tried to figure out, does it have the normal complement of the comet ices? What we usually see is water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. And so we tried to do this initially by just doing some modeling by plotting all of these crosses and triangles represent observations of the comet's brightness, again, in this logarithmic scale. And now this is plotted, we can either look at this scale as a function of distance, where this is the closest approach to the sun, or this is a uh, angular measure where it is along its orbit. So this is how much light the nucleus would reflect, assuming that we had made the right size. If we assume that the tail is driven off because water is outgassing from the comet, this is the shape of the curve that we would have. And we could adjust the amount of water and we could get it to match the early data in here. And that worked just fine, but there was a problem. Uh, Quan Zhi Yi and others looked back at some old archival data and found an image of comet Borisov that was quite bright. And so it couldn't be water because then this doesn't fit. And it turned out that Borisov is really rich in carbon monoxide. Now we see this in many solar system comets, but not this rich. So that made the chemistry a little bit unusual for Borisov. But other than that, it looked more or less like a comet. So what have we been learning about these comets? In fact, it's been really interesting. I've never seen so many papers written about two individual objects, and these numbers keep growing. Oumuamua now has 220 papers written. Over 100 of these are refereed, published in journals. I originally made these charts. I haven't done these same charts for Borisov, 
But you can see a lot of the papers were characterizing it. And then very interestingly, we're getting more papers that are not specifically cometary. It's bringing in people from other fields because of the potential to use these objects to study how planet building and star formation works elsewhere. And of course, we bring in a lot of papers on aliens that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and even Borisov is really climbing in the number of papers. So what have we learned from the two interstellar objects that we found? Well, that's not enough to say what the whole suite of them are like, but they certainly seem to be small, dark, reflect lights like comets and asteroids. And the two that we've seen are very different from each other. But what's very exciting is there may be a lot of them out there. The fact that we found two so close together in time um, and that the first one did not have a dust tail, which means it should have been much harder to find. There's probably a lot of these things out there. And this may enable us to really sample the chemistry of other star systems in a way that we can't because we're not gonna be able to send missions to these, not in our lifetimes. And there may already be a lot of this interstellar material in our solar system. So the trick will be, can we identify it? And when the next one comes through, can we really study it and understand what it is? And I'll get back to the missions in a moment, but this is the legacy of what we've learned scientifically but could we be wrong? Could Oumuamua actually be something else? <clears throat> well, in fact, in 2017, the group of scientists associated with the Breakthrough Initiatives, now the Breakthrough Project is intended to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the signs of technology. And so they wanted to do an experiment with Oumuamua and they conducted their experiment in December of 2017 with the Green Bank Telescope. And they wanted to listen for a signal from Oumuamua to see if there were signs of intelligence. And I know a lot of reporters asked me at the time, isn't this a silly experiment? And I said, absolutely not. This is a wonderful experiment. How could you not do the experiment? It's easy, it's cheap. Wouldn't you just kick yourself? It's the first object of its kind. You've got to do all the science that you possibly can. Well, they did not hear anything from Oumuamua, but it was still useful science because they put some upper limits because the, the wavelengths they were using could also possibly detect water. And so they did actually get some science out of this. Nevertheless, not to be daunted, um, Avi Loeb, who's a member of this team, and his student, uh, Shmuel Bialy, published a paper in 2018 that suggested that the acceleration was not due to comet outgassing, but it could be due to this solar radiation pressure that we had already discussed in the earlier paper, namely sunlight hits a surface, and if it's very low density, very low mass, the sunlight bounces off and that exerts a pressure. <clears throat> And that's fine, although they didn't cite the other paper as having thought of this first. They also suggested that this meant it was a new class of material and probably an artificial sail. So they were suggesting that this was an alien spacecraft. They actually said at the very end of the paper, therefore it's probably a, an operational probe sent intentionally to earth uh, by aliens. And in fact, some of the reviewers were not too kind about this. Um, this person, Alan Jackson said, I'm distinctly unconvinced and honestly think the study is flawed. Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And this paper is distinctly lacking in evidence, never mind the extraordinary evidence. Other than that, up until the end, it was a very nice paper. Well, Avi has continued to push the idea that this is an alien spacecraft. He's just published a book in 2021 um, suggesting that most scientists are being too arrogant to think that we're the only sentient life form in the universe. And I think that's unfair because there's a lot of people that believe there's life elsewhere, just that Oumuamua does not represent efforts of that life. And in fact, the reviews suggest that they don't, you know, it's an interesting book, but they don't believe that he's making the, a good case for this being alien. Now to contradict him, 
many of the team actually did think about this at the beginning because it was fun and you have to look at all the possibilities. And so right after it was discovered, as soon as we started to see the brightness variation, we realized very interestingly, the aspect ratio, the length to width possibly was about the same as the obelisk in 2001 Space Odyssey. I also remember just for fun because right after it was discovered, I mostly moved into my office 24 hours a day for a week to analyze data and work on papers. And so you start to explore things. If you remember this graph, it showed the color of Oumuamua as being red. I thought, huh, what are some common spacecraft metal components? What does their reflectivity look like? Uh, here's one, titanium, and it looks red. Doesn't mean titanium's red, it's very reflective, but it reflects more red light than blue. So in fact, it's fun to speculate, but you really have to have extraordinary evidence if you're gonna make the extraordinary claims. Could we have done better with Oumuamua? For example, what if we had one of these 30 meter class telescopes available, either the uh, ELT in Chile or the TMT that will hopefully be built in Hawaii? Well, had we had these available in one part of a night, we could have gotten a spectrum to get the chemistry. We might have been able to detect the gas. We could have detected the heat signature and definitively understood how big and how reflective. Hopefully, though, with the new Rubin telescope that will be coming online in Chile in just a few years now, this may be discovering uh, something like one a year. And maybe with these giant telescopes, we'll really get a good understanding of these objects. Could we have done any better if we had a mission? You know, if we had only had a spacecraft that could have reached Oumuamua and produced only a single close-up picture, we would have resolved a lot of the controversy. Um, and in fact, many teams looked at this and yes, we could have sent a mission to Oumuamua. It would have been very expensive. Um, it would have arrived in the mid 2030s, but very far from the sun, about twice the distance, two to three times the distance that Pluto's at. So there would have been very little light there and it would have been limited to a, a really fast flyby. And there's a lot of challenges with sending a mission to something like this. Um, first of all, they can come from any direction and it's really hard to send a spacecraft out of the plane of the solar system. It takes a lot more energy or you need a special geometry with a, a gravity assist from a giant planet. So the chances that you'll get the right trajectory are smaller. They're also likely to move very fast, which means um, hazards if there's dust around the object and you're flying a spacecraft near it. Uh, for example, for the Giotto mission with Comet Halley, the encounter velocity was uh, 68 kilometers a second, and the spacecraft was destabilized by a tiny little grain. Right now, the type of missions that NASA and other agencies have aren't really conducive to a really rapid response for some exciting new discovery like this. We would have liked to have seen Oumuamua just as it passed by the Earth when it was easy to get to and uh, brighter. Right now, the way a mission works, you may spend a couple of years in proposal development. This is actually a chart showing the various phases to get a spacecraft ready for launch. And if you look at the timeline here, it takes about six years from the proposal submission until you're able to launch a spacecraft. And that's just too long because maybe we'll start to find some of these um, 10 years before they make their closest approach, but more likely we're gonna find them like we did with Oumuamua or Borisov when we have about a year or less that we can observe them. So that means instead of today's mission style, we need to have a spacecraft that's already built and ready to go. And that was part of the strategy from the, the KISS workshop in 2018 was to think about what could you do if you had a whole fleet of spacecraft that were ready and able to target an interesting target. And so one idea might be that you have a set of spacecraft that are all attached until they get to your target. And then you release some of the smaller spacecraft, which might be CubeSats or slightly bigger that 
aren't as expensive as the mother craft, they can approach closely and do some reconnaissance a little bit later along the timeline. You can send out some more to do some mapping and some imaging. Maybe you have an active experiment where you impact the object so that you release a lot of dust that you collect and analyze. By having a whole suite of spacecraft, you mitigate risks because if any one of these gets destroyed, you still have your mission. And you can do a lot of multiple things that you wouldn't be able to on a normal flyby mission. So there's a lot of technology development here that needs to be done in terms of coordinating a suite of instruments like this and have them autonomous. Well, in fact, there is one mission that is attempting to do that. This is a European mission, the Comet Interceptor. It's due to launch in 2029. And the idea is it will sit near Earth in one of the Lagrange points, just waiting for an appropriate comet. Ideally, a long period comet, the type that we haven't visited with a spacecraft. I know they're hoping for an interstellar object, but I think the chance that they'll get one of those that will be at the right place, the right distance from the sun and in the plane of the solar system is pretty small. But they're going to have three spacecraft, a spacecraft A that's from European agency, um, spacecraft B1 that's from Japan and B2, and they'll all have different experiments, nine uh, instruments in total to watch the flyby of the target. Just a couple last things to finish up, a couple of fun things. Um, I did give a TED talk on Oumuamua in 2018, which was both exciting, scary, a lot of fun. And like a true nerd, I have been clocking the views on TED since then. And interestingly, there was a, a jump, a steep jump here. When the uh, Bialy and Loeb Aliens paper came out, suddenly there was intense interest in Oumuamua. Um, interesting, it started to slow down and was almost completely flat. And then the second interstellar object was discovered. It didn't rise as quickly. Avi Loeb published his book on aliens, and I wasn't keeping track of it avidly then, so I don't know if there was a big jump. Here we are today. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be any jump as a consequence of this colloquium. But just to finish off at the end, one other really fun thing that I would not have anticipated is that microbreweries have gotten very excited about the concept of alien beer, uh, inspired beer from alien objects entering the solar system or interstellar objects. And this one came out in 2018, Oumuamua Milk Stout. And the back of the label says, forever caressed by the blackest space, the hurtling megalith returns, earthlings, prodigal creator in dense velvet wrapped disguise, its secret pilots seek adulation, sweet desolation, eternal cold burn, sapiens myths rewritten when revealed the cosmic truth inside. So I would really like to taste some of this. It's brewed in Vancouver. So if anyone's up there, uh, let me know what it tastes like. It'll be very interesting. With that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Meech. Uh, it is very exciting because there are a lot of questions coming in from uh, the audience. <clears throat> so uh, let's start. The first question is, uh, how many solar system objects do we know have been ejected from the solar system by Jupiter or other planets? Uh, can we use this to somehow predict how many extrasolar objects uh, we should see? Um, I don't think we know exactly how many were ejected, but there were a lot of them. Um, certainly people who have done models of how to construct a solar system, most a, a large fraction of the mass early on gets ejected outwards. And how many that translates to depends on their size. So usually they think of it in terms of mass. So there have been predictions. I know there was a paper that came out just before Oumuamua was discovered predicting how many of these things might be flying around based on our non-detection so far, given that there'd been about 20 years of surveys of the sky. And the fact that Oumuamua was detected without a tail said, wow, there may be one of these things inside our solar system between us and the sun at any moment in time. 
Um, and there may be a lot of them that are sort of hiding in our Oort cloud of comets. There have been a couple comets that have had really unusual chemistry, and people are now thinking, huh, maybe those came from somewhere else also. So I can't give you an exact number. Sorry. Thank you for the answer. Uh, the next question is, uh, did the magnitude of Oumuamua's acceleration change uh, as it moved farther away from the sun or did it stay constant? The acceleration dropped off as about one over the square of the distance. And so it was accelerating, but it was slowing down as it moves away from the sun. Um, now that would have been a sure, sure. I was going to say that would be a, a sure signal of alien um, technology if it suddenly changed direction. I, you know, some people have said, "What would be definitive proof?" And if the acceleration did something weird, like it completely changed direction, that would convince me. That makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is: uh, What is the mass of the Oumuamua? Uh, and how was it measured uh, from the uh, astronomical observations? I don't have the number off the top of my head on the mass. We couldn't actually measure the mass. All we could do is estimate its size. And again, there's an uncertainty on the size because the real measurement was its brightness. Okay. And the brightness that we get will depend on the size and how reflective it was. And we don't know how reflective it was. It, we assumed it was like comets and comets are very, very dark. They're about as dark as an iPhone. They reflect about 4% of the light. And we made that assumption. Some asteroids can be as bright as 25% reflectivity. And so if something were a lot brighter, it would be smaller to give us the same amount of light. And of course, if it was an alien spacecraft, metals re reflect a lot of light. Um, so on the assumption that we knew it was dark, we got an estimate of the size. And then we made an estimate of its mass, just assuming a density like comets. So there's a lot of assumptions in there. But doing all of that, then assuming a spherical or an sort of a regular shape, an elongated cigar-like shape, you can estimate the mass. And then we tried to compare that to the acceleration and it more or less held together. I see, I see. So it's multiple steps and multiple observations. Well, multiple <laughs> steps, one observation and lots of assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> I see, uh, that's great. Um, so the next question, uh, interesting one. Um, so of the four stars that were potential home system for Oumuamua, uh, instead of being the origin star system, uh, could they have been possibly used to provide gravity assist for Oumuamua, uh, making its uh, origin deeper and beyond those uh, four stars? Um. You know, certainly it's possible, but actually the chances, space is actually quite big and things are really far apart. So the chance that Oumuamua is going to pass very close to more than one system is very small. So the passages just weren't close enough to make those plausible, nor would it have affected the trajectory of Oumuamua. The one star that we know that affected the trajectory was us, for sure. Mm. I see. That makes sense. And in fact, we think um, probably the experiment to trace back to the home will never succeed unless we get very lucky and a nearby star very nearby ejects it because there's just so much uncertainty in the the paths of the stars as you go way back in time. Um, I have another question. Um, it says, if JWST had launched on time, uh, would it have been possible to reveal more information about Oumuamua or uh, 2019 uh, Borisov? Um, for example, uh, would it uh, have been an instrument uh, for spectral analysis? Well, I think if it had launched early enough that it was in our field of view, and you know, most of these telescopes have really severe restrictions that they can't point anywhere close to the sun. Um, 
yes, the instrumentation is such that it would have been great for looking at the composition of the surface or getting a really good thermal measurement to help us understand its reflectivity and size. So we'll have to wait for the next one. Uh, next question is, is it possible that one side of Oumuamua is shiny and other side is somehow uh, less, less so? Uh, so it's not that it's very elongated, but instead has very different uh, albedo on each side. Uh, is that a possibility? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an excellent question. Um, and the answer is no, because of the light curve. And whenever you have a light curve, if you remember the light curve, it, it came up and had narrow minima and then a broader top. And that's always the signal that it's a shape dominated light curve. Whereas if it's just one hemisphere is bright and one is dark, then you tend to get a very uniform sine wave. So no, the light curve said that this is due to shape. I see. I didn't know that you could extract so much information just from the shape of the, yeah. the light curve. Um, okay. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, what do you think of the exotic compositions proposed for Oumuamua, uh, such as like the one you mentioned, the hydrogen iceberg uh, or uh, nitrogen iceberg? Uh, do you find these uh, likely theories or um, less so compared to other ones? Well, I certainly think it's a creative solution. And the reason that they would pick hydrogen and nitrogen is that the experiments that could have been done and were done to detect gas certainly wouldn't have detected either of those gases. But I think they're not necessary. Um, and I find some of the requirements in the models I don't agree with some of the modeling that they did, but I think it's a very innovative idea. And it's, I especially like the way that both papers are trying to explain the shape um, because that's one of the harder things to explain. And the hydrogen iceberg one, I, I really like the idea that because it is outgassing and eroding the surface so far from the sun that by the time it gets into the sun, even if you started with a reasonably more spherical thing, it would erode it into an elongated shape, just like your bathtub soap. So I think that part was very nice. Um, nobody has yet gotten a paper that's completely gotten everything to hold together. And this isn't the fault of the scientists. We just had about a week or more of data and we just didn't have enough. Right, yeah, it, it's still amazing how much data you collected in uh, just a week of science. Uh, so it's, it's definitely very cool. Um, <clears throat> so this person asks, uh, how was the change in acceleration of object model during the, the trace back attempt? Uh, so in particular, uh, you mentioned the excess acceleration uh, rather than gravitational. Um, what were, can you elaborate more on the uh, steps involved in that? Not the detailed steps that was done by our, our JPL colleagues and uh, Marco Michelli, but basically you have to assume that the same acceleration we saw on the object as it was leaving applied as it came inwards, because that's all you can do. We had no information as it came inwards. So we have to still assume that it also showed the same acceleration. And that's not necessarily going to be the truth because sometimes we have comets that have what you call seasonal effects. You know, maybe as it comes around the sun now, a hemisphere that never saw any sunlight suddenly gets sunlight on it and it starts new jets and new outgassing and it will change the acceleration. But that's all we could do. I see, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, what would have caused Oumuamua to tumble? Um, would the tumbling be expected to dampen out as it travels further, or is it going to continue? Well, eventually you would expect the tumbling to dampen out just due to internal friction, but we actually did do a calculation in one of the papers that shows that it would not have um, damped out over the time period that we would expect, you know, billions and billions of years. So probably... Um, 
it will have some sort of tumbling motion for quite a long time. Now, what causes it? I mean, it could have been its initial kick out of its home solar system. It could be that the tumbling started relatively recently due to this outgassing, you know, the non uniform jets coming off of the surface. And in fact, we've seen many comets where their rotation period changes drastically due to the, the changes in outgassing. I see. So as it whips by the sun, it changes its behavior. Um, cool. Um, next question is, uh, where is Oumuamua going? Um, are there any stars that in that direction that uh, you may potentially interact with? Well, it's the same problem we had tracing it back home. Um, we can certainly trace it on its outbound leg for quite a while. And that's a very interesting question. I don't know if the team has actually looked specifically for stars where it's going to, because I don't know what the scientific point of that would be. It's very interesting, but it's not that we will be able to observe an interaction, for example. Right. Um, the next question is, can you estimate the material properties of Oumuamua uh, due to its survival upon the close solar approach? Actually, many people tried to estimate the material properties of Oumuamua based on its rotation because it's so elongated. And so it does have to have some strength that can't just be strengthless. And actually during its close solar approach, since if it is cometary, comets are very, very porous. So they're actually excellent insulators. So the heat wave from even that really close solar approach would take a while to penetrate very far beneath the surface. So in fact, we don't expect a dramatic change from the heat other than it will eventually penetrate inwards. And if there are ices there, cause them to convert to a gas sublimate and leave the surface. Um, so that could be what happened and the reason we saw the acceleration. On the other hand, in terms of uh, destabilizing the interior, no, from the thermal point of view, from the gravitational point of view, I also think not. And I don't think anyone has looked at that. I see. Uh, it's cool that uh, I didn't know that uh, comets then uh, uh, act as an insulator uh, when they are um, passing by the sun. Well, well comets um, are mostly, yeah. some of them are 90% porous. And in a vacuum, the heat transport's really poor in a porous medium. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <clears throat> um, okay, well, uh, thank you so much for all the questions. That we ha actually have one last question. Um, so the last question is, are the trajectories of the two ISOs uh, similar enough to imply that uh, they could originate from a common system or uh, their behavior may be uh, somehow correlated at all? <clears throat> no, completely different. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for answering all the questions. Thank you everyone for uh, submitting these questions. Uh, the KISS team actually has sent a small gift uh, to Dr. Meech. So uh, if you could uh, take a look and open it up for us. They told me I could cut it in advance, but not peer inside. <laughs> it's a little tote bag with Oumuamua as an asteroid on one side and Oumuamua oh, wow. as a comet on the other side. <laughs> Thank you very much. But there's no Oumuamua anything inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meech, again for the talk tonight. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk as much as I did. Um, we have some quick announcements before we go. Uh, first, please take time to uh, fill our survey uh, when you leave this lecture. And second, we have a plan for the next webinar uh, with the former JPL director, uh, Dr. Charles Delachi, about 40 years of innovation in Earth observation with uh, space-borne radar. 
So this seminar will be on November 2nd. Uh, so please make sure to sign up for that event if you're interested. And thanks again, everyone. And see you soon at the next seminar.